I'm going to introduce our next two speakers that are going to talk about cover crop and weed control. First, we have Ruth McCabe, who um, is a conservation agronomist for Heartland Cooperative, and she's a certified professional agronomist. And then we have Rob Stout, and Rob Stout farms in southeast Iowa in Washington County, where he's been using cover crops since 2009. So Ruth, take it away. Great. Lydia, just nod for me. You can hear me, right? I can. Great. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks, Lydia. And hi, everyone. I'm very excited to be here today to talk with you all about using cover crops for weed control. Uh, yeah, since we don't have a lot of time, um, I am going to be zipping through some of this material pretty quickly. But if you do have further questions, I'm going to be in one of the breakout rooms. And also, I encourage you to email me, um, rmccabe at heartlandcoop.com. So I am gonna be narrowing our focus just a little bit, as you can see there, to a row crop farm in the upper Midwest. So I'm making the assumption that you're primarily working with a corn bean rotation. So the more diverse your rotation is, for instance, if you have a small grain uh, year, the more creative you can get with cover crops and the more value you can get out of them. But I wanna start with what I view as the most common grower that I discuss beginning cover crops with. Next slide, please. So you've already heard some of this. You are definitely going to be hearing this again. <laughs> cover crops provide all kinds of benefits, um, especially for row crop farms. Um, but the one we're gonna talk about is the last on this list, but not the least, and that is weed control. Cover crops can provide very good weed control. Next slide, please. So cover crops provide weed control in, in one of three, sometimes all of these three ways. They smother weeds through the sheer volume of their biomass. They can outcompete weeds for limiting resources like sunlight or nutrients or water, or also allelopathy. So I call these silent soil ninjas, but they, as their biomass or their roots decompose, they release compounds, for lack of a better word, um, that inhibit the growth of other small seeded weeds. And like I said, a lot of cover crops, they can do all three. Next slide, please. So when I'm working with growers who want to use cover crops for the first time, these five questions are the five questions that I almost always get. They're very common. Those first three questions, what species should I start with? How do I kill them? How do I work them into my rotation? I'm actually going to be addressing those questions as I talk about some specific cover crop species, so in a few slides. But those bottom two questions are the ones that I'm going to answer right now. Next slide, please. So the first one, how do I get a, a cover crop to establish well? This honestly just comes down to good old classic agronomy, right? So you want good seed to soil contact, you want good moisture, and you want good temperatures. So good seed to soil contact, the best way to do that, obviously, would be drilling your seed after a harvest. Um, however, the further north you go, the less growing season you get after harvest. A lot of folks aerial seed or they overseed into a standing crop. So if you're doing that, you want to try to time it with a good rain, a good rain in the next couple of days to work that seed into the soil profile a bit, and also probably consider increasing your seeding rate a bit. Um, also temperatures, right? So there are a lot of crops that aren't going to grow very well if it's too early or if it's too late. Um, all I'm saying here is maybe don't seed your cover crop in the middle of December. And then the next question, what should I do if they don't grow well or I get a poor stand? This honestly really depends on the time of year, how expensive the cover crop is, what you're doing with your operation. So sometimes folks will reseed, especially you know, if the seed is cheap or if they have enough of it, if they have extra, or if there's enough time, um, it's early enough in the season that it just makes sense to do it again. Or if they need to, you know, if they need to reseed, it's a part of their rotation, they need it. Otherwise, if it's too late in the year and it doesn't make sense to reseed, you might just have to treat the field as a weedy field in the spring and act accordingly. Um, you're going to have a lot of successes going into working with cover crops, but you're also going to have those years where timing just doesn't work out. It's really dry. You don't get the moisture you were depending on. Um, it's, it's okay to periodically throw the towel in on a cover crop stand and terminate it. Um, you, won't, you won't be the first to do that and you won't be the last, but don't give up on it if that happens. Uh, next slide. So this rule is so important, I gave it its own boring slide with no pictures. <laughs> and that is you've really got to plan your cover crop the way you would plan a cash crop. I work with corn growers. I know how much nerdy, geeky time they spend agonizing, uh, comparing two hybrids that have one that has a 4.5 out of five score and one that has a five out of five score. 
you all put a lot of effort into planting your cash crops and you really wanna put um, a similar message into your cover crops. The more time you put into planning a plan A, B and C, including backup plans, the better your experience overall is just gonna be working with cover crops. Next slide. All right, so the first species I'm gonna talk about is winter rye or cereal rye. And this actually answers that first question, you know, what cover crop should I start with? In my opinion, I like winter rye or cereal rye. It's a great gateway drug to cover crops. Uh, some folks will disagree with me, but I like it because there's just a lot of support out there for it already. There's a ton of publications, there's a ton of, um, there's a ton of interesting information out there that's already been done. And uh, it's accessible to both, you know, for both organic operations as well as conventional operations. So I like to start with winter rye. It's allelopathic and it outcompetes weeds. So I really like that. Um, it can actually be pretty forgiving for when you seed it. It's got a pretty broad time frame that you can seed it, even into, even I say before November, but I mean, people plant it late November and the stuff still grows. It's amazing. The best time to plant it is anywhere from August 15th to October 15th. You get the best winter cover that way and the best spring return. Um, folks will broadcast or drill it anywhere from one to three bushel an acre. Now, if you're drilling after harvest, you would you could drill at a lower rate, maybe one bushel an acre. But if you're broadcasting, you really want to increase that seeding rate. Um, it's better to go with like two bushel. In the spring, boy, this stuff comes back like a beast. All right. So in the spring, you want to terminate it a minimum of two weeks before you're going to be planting your spring crop, your cash crop. You can spray, you know, spring plow, disc, roller crimp or mow. For those of you who are organic, you would roller crimp or mow uh, at anthesis specifically. That picture in the lower corner there is a rye flowering. Okay, so you want to terminate when they've switched over into their reproductive mode. Um, and so most people use when they're using rye, um, they're going into soybeans, but you can you can use rye and go into corn. Uh, people that I work with who do that are they use a starter. Absolutely. I saw somebody ask that question in the last presentation. They absolutely use a starter uh, with their corn. Next slide, please. So this slide here just emphasizes that point that I made where with rye, you know, the earlier you get it planted in the fall, the better experience you're gonna have with it. I took both of these pictures, the bottom picture, um, same farm. I took them both on November 12th. That bottom picture there was seeded in, um, I think mid August. I can't see the, the text for whatever reason. And then the top picture um, that was air seeded in um, late October. And I took both those pictures the same day. You can easily tell here which crop is gonna have better um, winter cover and which is also gonna be coming back a little bit earlier and a little bit thicker in the spring. Next slide. Okay, so this real quick here, I just wanna briefly talk about using a thick rye mat as a weed control mulch in the spring. So this is really popular to do. You saw it in the last presentation too. It's especially if you're going into soybeans, folks will plant rye in the early fall and then they allow it to grow to anthesis in the spring and then they terminate, flatten, plant into it. Um, some folks will plant into the standing rye and then terminate after this. This really comes down to your comfort level, the machinery you have on hand, et cetera. Um, but if you're gonna try this, you really wanna use a higher seeding rate. Um, really, especially if you're organic, preferably closer to that two bushel per acre in order to get that nice thick mulch that's gonna block weeds. So um, I'm, I have lots of publications on this. You are welcome to email me and I can send you more PDFs than you know what to do with. Next slide. Okay, so getting away from winter rye, we'll touch on another one, sorghum sedan grass. I love sorghum sedan grass. It's a beast of a grass. It's allelopathic, it smothers. It's a smother crop, it's, it outcompetes weeds. There are many ways to use sorghum sedan. So if you're planning to uh, planting it as a weed control cover crop, you would use a fairly high seeding rate. Um, the minimum is something around 40 to 50 pounds. I know growers who do as high as 100 pounds. I think that's crazy, but some people swear by it. Um, so, and you, and you know, you would want to increase that 40 to 50 pounds if you're broadcasting. So I think on average, I see somewhere around 60 to 70 pounds, but it just depends. Um, you also want to plant when the soil temps are at least 60 to 65 degrees and rising, seeing how most folks are planting this midsummer in the case of a double crop or after they take their silage out or something, it's not a problem. You get warm soil temps pretty easily. Um, you can also graze or cut sorghum sedan for hay. It does have good forage values. And that's another reason some folks use it. Um, the minimum amount of time to get a good cutting off of it though is 35 to 40 days. So it is an ideal late summer weed control method if you've harvested say like a spring grain crop or if you've taken silage off. 
and that maybe you need another forage option. The thing I like the most about sorghum sedan is that it winter kills very nicely. And so if you're purely planting it for a thick spring mat, I know folks who've done this, um, similar to that winter rye scenario, but you don't have to worry about terminating it in the spring. Um, however, in that kind of scenario, then I would recommend pushing that planting back to late August or early September. Um, and, and the reason for this is that it just prevents it from getting really woody when it, after it frost kills. And also um, it can be really thick and unruly. Uh, so some kind of mechanical breakup will help a lot. Next slide. All right, so this isn't a species, this is a power duo, but I'll mention some species. Um, Brassica small grain is a great duo um, for weed control. It's really popular. Um, so the, for, the, the brassica, also known as a mustard, uh, typically people are using forage brassicas or forage kale. And the reason why is those are really leafy and they can um, you know, shade out crops underneath them. This is an allelopathic slash smother crop combo. Um, Typically the small grain that's used, it depends on if you want this to come back in the spring. Obviously you'd use rye if you want it to come back in the spring. If you use oats, it's gonna die over winter. Um, so this duo is typically broadcast or overseeded into standing crops, anywhere from late July to early September, depends on where you are and what your moisture is gonna look like. Um, the brassica is around two to four pounds an acre, typically in this blend. And then the small grain is usually like 20 to 40 pounds per acre for the, uh, I think I just said for the small grain, I have these boxes popping up, so they're distracting me. Um, the brassicas will winter kill, definitely. And again, as I said, the small grain, it just depends on what you use. If you use rye, it's gonna come back. So you have to keep that in mind for spring termination. And, and we already talked about some of that. Um, but if you use oats, they will, they'll die over winter. And if you use something that completely winter kills, then typically the, the, the breakdown in the spring is pretty, it's pretty fast. As soon as you get spring warm up, you'll start seeing breakdowns of the biomass. So you don't have to worry so much about a starter if you're using stuff that, that winter killed. Next slide. All right, last but not least, buckwheat. This is my favorite cover crop by far. I don't really know why. I think it's because I like the smell uh, and bees really like it. Um, but it's a really fast growing smother crop. And so you, we're talking 45 days from planting this stuff to when you've got a very thick, robust stand of a cover crop. Um, so it's really great for seeding between double crops like June or July timeframe if you've taken out um, a small grain and you just need something for, for quick midsummer cover or late August, early September, again, for if you've taken out silage um, for some quick fall cover. This stuff frost kills and mechanically kills ridiculously easily. And I mean, like I have a friend once who described it as if you so much as look at buckwheat side-eyed, it'll fall over and she's not wrong, it's very true. <laughs> so it, break, it breaks down really quickly. There's not a delay in nutrient availability at all with this stuff, um, but you won't get any kind of wind Winter, winter cover, you know, protection with this stuff. It, it breaks down pretty fast. So you don't get any of those overwintering benefits. Um, you would drill it at 50 to 60 pounds per acre. You would broadcast maybe even up to hundred pounds. It just depends. Um, some folks, I, I know folks who've done everything in between. Next slide, please. All right, so these are just some resources. Um, that I would recommend looking online. They're all, they're all free. You can download most of these as PDFs online for free. I recommend them as great resources. Um, in addition to any of the resources on the PFI website, strongly recommend the cover crop resources on the PFI website. But these are also really great um, to help you decide on cover crop species for a row crop operation. Um, and from there, I will turn it on over to Rob and thank you all so much. And I will answer some of the questions that have popped up in the chat for me. Great, thanks Ruth. All right, we will get Rob started. I am here. Great, can you hear me? I can, you're on. Okay. Let me take it away. Yes, take it away, please. Okay, uh, as she said, my name is Rob Stout. I farm in, in uh, Washington County, which is in Southeast Iowa. So, uh, I, when I think of cover crops and the advantages, there are so many, they're multitude and suppressing weeds is sort of on the list, but it's, it's still an important one. And that's what I was asked to speak of. So uh, we'll just get started here and go on to the uh, first slide. And uh, sorry about, I, I normally am a corn soybean rotation. And uh, this year I also raised a small grain, which was uh, hybrid rye. I had a hundred acres of hybrid rye. So I got a chance to uh, seed my co cover crop a little earlier. We took off the hybrid rye. I think we were done around the middle of July. And this picture is taken about a month later. 
uh, and it was a combination of oats, radish, vetch. Uh, there might have been something else in there. Let's see, peas. And uh, so it's about a month after planting. We had some pretty good moisture then, and then it, it quit raining towards the end of July, but we got a very good stand. And so uh, that's the key to getting a good stand. And I think the key to weed control in small grains, at falling small grains, because that's the time of the year when weeds are actively germinating and growing, especially water hemp still germinates clear into the end of summer. So uh, get good water hemp control, you've got to get uh, a good stand quickly. And we also have volunteer uh, rye, I'll have to admit that through the combine. I didn't get it all, and that was spread pretty good, so we had that. So uh, there's the first picture. I guess we can go on to the next slide, and uh, we'll see what it looked like, as I think I took a picture about three weeks ago. And uh, the oats, of course, is, it pretty much died by then because we'd had several frosts by then, but it was it, it had headed out and died, and, and you could see the radish under there, and I think you can see a bench in one of these pictures. Let me go on to another picture here. I think I got two or three of the uh, of this. As long as you get a good stand, you're going to get good weed control. There it is. The, you can see the stuff's up to about my waist to high. If we go to the last picture. I can say what why you why you need to have good stand. Uh, my son was doing the seeding because I we wanted to get it seeded quickly right after harvest, and this was where the seed tenders part. And as you can see, it's a lot of foxtail and, and you can see four or five uh, water hemp's in the distance there too. So that's what happens if you don't get a good stand, especially in the summer when you, when weeds are actively germinating. So I'll go to the next slide and we'll uh, talk about my, my pr program after corn. And uh, we, we drill it all now, 10 inch uh, spacings and in the early part of the season, we started around the 21st of uh, September this year, and we tried to get a drill out pretty much behind the combine. I will, uh, I will back off my uh, seal rye to about 35 pounds, also add maybe 12 pounds of oats and a pound or two of uh, mustard and radish, vetch, things like that. That, that only, that's only about 10 days, and then I want to switch to straight cereal rye, and I go to a, a bushel, which is 56 pounds. So there's what it looked like a few weeks after seeding uh, into corn stubble. Uh, and uh, we'll go on to the next page, and or the next slide. And that uh, should show what it's like in the spring. I also participated in a project with uh, Practical Farmers and Allison Roberts of Iowa State, where we did two different uh, termination dates. We did one 18 days before planting, which is on the right, and uh, six days after planting was on the left. So this was actually the day I went out and planted. I think it's before I went through with the planter. But that was the day of planting. So that's about how tall you saw the cereal rye was. It was a good knee high or a little bit more. Uh, we don't really do either of those things too much, six days after or 18 days before. I try to do it pretty much right at planting, uh, sometimes maybe a day or two after, a day or two before. I, I time them pretty close together. So uh, this is what you'd, you'd see. And, and of course, you don't get a lot of weed control if you're just hitting Roundup to kill the uh, cereal rye before planting 18 days, Then that because after that's when the weeds start germinating. But uh, as you can see on the left, there weren't any weeds coming there that time. So we can go on to the next slide and that'll show my uh, soybean crop. What I do in soybeans. Uh, yeah. Oh, I guess this wasn't the next slide. This is what you want in the end is a, a good clean, clean uh, crop of corn in the fall with no weeds in it. And we've been pretty well successful doing that and uh, with using cover crops. Been using cover crops for 11 years now on, on pretty much every acre for the last six years. So on the next slide, I think will be our what we do following uh, following corn, going to soybeans. We can get there. They're a little bit of a lag. I should ask them before I'm ready for them, I guess. But we seed uh, pretty much just straight cereal rye into our corn stalks, standing corn stalks. Don't do anything in corn stalks before that. So 
that next slide isn't coming up on my screen yet. We'll see 56 pounds breaker drilled right into the sanding corn stalks. Lydia, are you seeing the slide? So I have changed it. There we go. Okay, great. <laughs> and uh, then we'll uh, go on to the next slide, which is uh, in the spring. I didn't take any pictures last spring, I guess, into my uh, rye when we planted, but it was about like it was in that previous picture of the uh, the corn where it was around knee high because I planted all my my uh, beans by the May 2nd. Now, a year ago, and this is a year ago picture, I just wanted to show you that it's okay if rye gets a lot taller. This this is some was over my head. So we had a, a, a rainy May last spring. We had like nine or 10 inches, 11 inches of rain in May, and so we weren't able to plant any beans until June. So this was what it looked like I went out there. I think that was the day before I was ready to get in there planting. So you go to the next slide and it'll show, I think, my sprayer out there, which I can raise up to my boom only goes to five feet. You can see the uh, rise over the five foot. But I have no problem going into rye that tall. It just to, to get rye that tall down here, usually that means it's probably at least late May. And I prefer to plant a little sooner than that. So the next slide will show me planting into that five foot plus tall rye, which I planted before I had sprayed it. Uh, but I do the same thing with, with beans. I, I usually plan the spraying, usually right after planting or right before planting. So uh, there you can see, I, I don't really have any trouble getting a good, good seed soil contact into the five foot rye even. And yes, I do have an auto steer on this tractor when I did it before I had auto steer, it's a little hard to see where I was going. That's why I don't even use the markers. So I think that's my my plan. Uh, herbicide wise, I, I put my burn down with a residual right away in both corn and soybeans. I like to use the seed chlor and and uh, have my Roundup to uh, terminate, and then I'll come back with the poster birds later on. And, and it, like in soybeans, I have stand beans and I have enlist beans so I'll do the program they have those plus put warrant with it as a as, as another herbicide to have a little more uh, extended weed control time. One thing I've really seen is we used to have mare's tail on almost every field and we have zero mare's tail. It took about four to five years of cover crops but you just get 100% control of mare's tail and that used to be a, a serious weed. And we don't have any giant rag, we either except maybe a few in the fence rows. Sometimes they throw in the fence rows. But I think that's the last slide. So I guess I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions. We'll just go to that. Great. Well, thanks, Rob and Ruth. Um, keep those questions coming in the chat box. Rob, I have a question for you to start. Um, I'm curious in those years when you're getting really high biomass, are you tweaking your herbicide regimen at all? Or have you tweaked it over the years just by using cover crops continually? Yeah, I don't really change the herbicide, even if there's a five foot of biomass. It, it doesn't seem to make that much difference. I, you get more, you get a longer weed control from having more biomass than corn. You see the, you see the weeds germinate right away a lot quicker. But, uh, and it'll hold it longer, but in our case, we have hogs and we have hog manure and, and so we're buying soybean meal and getting somebody else's water hemp seed along with their own. And so we always would have water hemp germinate later in the summer. It just, it might delay it a couple of weeks by having uh, four or 5,000 pounds of biomass versus a thousand pounds, but we would still have them. So we still use our normal herbicide program. Okay, and one more question for you, Rob, and then I'll give one to Ruth. Um, here's a question. Have you influenced any of your neighbors with cover crops? Are they doing anything different or? Well, we've increased the acres quite a bit in our neighborhood. We've, we've had several field days here over the last 10 years. And so uh, we're also part of a watershed, uh, West Fork Creek, Creek Watershed, which we were one of the original uh, watersheds to get funding from uh, 
state of Iowa, IDOLS in their watershed initiative. And so we got some money and, and, and shared cost shared cover cropping. So we got a lot of neighbors to, to try it because of that. So uh, we've increased the acres here in our area quite a bit. Awesome. Okay, Ruth, I have a question for you. There's been a lot of chatter in the chat box about termination dates, especially before soybeans. And I know your rule of thumb on your slide was two weeks before planting. I'm wondering if you could comment about terminating before corn versus soybeans and, and what maybe a beginner should do. Yeah, and that was um, basically the issue there is it comes down to what you got going in. So obviously, if you're going into soybeans, um, you have more time in the spring. Um, and the idea really with rye is to let it get as big and bushy as possible. I know it like, makes a lot of people really nervous when they see this massive stand of rye out there when they're first starting to work with rye. Um, and so you have more time to terminate in the spring if you're going into beans than you do if you're going into corn. And the, the bare minimum recommendation that most folks will tell you is two weeks. Um, I know a lot of growers who will terminate earlier than that, um, just so that they know for sure that they're getting things taken care of. And you can also have some issues with cutworms. And um, I know with organic growers, you know, they don't have all the tools and the, the chemical tools in the toolbox. It's not like a value statement there. It's just kind of a truth. Um, and so they'll, I know a lot of organic growers will try to terminate um, a little bit earlier too, um, usually mechanically, obviously, because you can't terminate anthesis so early going into corn. Um, so it, the two weeks is the bare minimum and some folks have problems with that. Some folks don't. And I've worked with growers across that spectrum. So I just use that term because it's kind of what is accepted, but some folks terminate much earlier. Great. And I don't, I think this question has gotten answered in the chat box, but here's one for you. Um, would you recommend seeding um, buckwheat and cereal rye, especially if you're interested in grazing? Oh, I did answer that one. And I think I actually, oh, so sent it. no, it's okay. I, I think I sent it privately to somebody. So I apologize to whoever that was. <laughs> um, but yeah, I did. Um, yes, sure. You can seed buckwheat. Um, you can seed buckwheat with cereal rye in the fall. Definitely. Um, and it, it, yep you can graze it, um, but it will, it'll die pretty fast. I mean, that stuff, if you even step on it, I mean, it's over, it'll, it'll terminate. I will say someone mentioned this in the chat and I would agree with it is that buckwheat reseeds itself pretty easily. If it starts to flower, you need to get it terminated if you don't want buckwheat weeds. Now, I don't care about, like most of the growers I work with don't care about buckwheat weeds because buckwheat terminates so easily. But if you're an organic grower, that's something to keep in mind because you can't, I mean, you can't spray it, right? So it mechanically kills pretty easily too. Um, so I don't, you know, some people don't like having buckwheat weeds, um, but most of the growers I work with can terminate it pretty easily. So it's not a concern for them. But if you are concerned about it, just time it 40, 45 days out from the, the, nath, the average frost in your area and you'll probably be fine because even a small hint of frost and buckwheat is done so. Great. Um, okay, I think this question just got answered in the chat box, but I'm still going to put it to you um, first, Ruth, which is um, if you're, uh, people often ask about allelopathy issues with rye and the following crops. So this is specifically about harvesting rye for hay. And are you having issues with allelopathy in the crop after that? Yeah, so typically rye allelopathy only affects small seeded crops. You don't have to worry as much about like corn or beans, but depending on what you're going, like, with, I know with vegetable growers, it, it can be a problem with like, cause you know, they're gonna try to grow carrots or something. And they, if they had rye in, they can see some inhibition of their carrot growth or their lettuce growth or whatever. Um, but you know, usually with, with corner beans, rye allelopathy isn't a concern. And I, there's some research, there's some research out there that, that supports that. I've never seen it. Um, I've never seen that issue with corn and bean growers. So that's all I can say there. I don't know, maybe Rob has um, some other experience. Yeah, Rob, do you want to chime in for a second here and just talk about any allelopathy or lack there? Yeah, I don't, I don't see allelopathy, and I, I think I thought that before I, when I started growing uh, cover crops, but I've found that it's not allelopathy in, in corn. It's really a nitrogen situation where you can have a nitrogen tie up, and so, and that's why we talked about putting starter with if you're starting with if going with into corn, which is important. But I also added nitrogen to the planter, so we've got, so we're not having that corn plant be short of nitrogen. So my my starter only has like four pounds of nitrogen. So I've also put at least ten gallons of starter of nitrogen over the road, just dribbled back behind the rows. So uh, I don't run that 
plant short of nitrogen because I know, because I'm leaving my rye a lot longer and it's still green when I'm planting. That's kind of important. If you terminate two weeks before, like a lot of people recommend, then it's probably not as near a big a problem, but it's pretty essential if you're planting at the time of, of termination. Great. And then one last quick question for Rob. Um, there's a question about your drill width, if it's seven and a half or 10 inches, or does it even really matter? I don't know the matter. We had a seven and a half inch drill and then we traded uh, a year ago now, a little over a year ago for 10. It just, cause that's what the planter had on it. So e either way is pretty good. With cereal rye, uh, it'll tiller. Now, if you plant it late, you won't get any tillering in the fall. If you plant it early, you get some tillering in the fall and then it'll till in the spring is what it re really fills in. I mean, if we get a warm day here next week, the rye will green up again. Or if not, it'll green up in February of the warm day and in March, it'll war it warms up, it'll green up and really green and just take off and start tillering and, and fill in so it covers in those spots. So that's why I say seven and a half, 10 inch rows. that make a difference because your weeds don't normally come up until mid to late April or to March or to May. And by then you've filled that in with your tilling of the line. 